Who are the celebrities and the scammers they fell in love with? Let's find out, starting with... Number five. Yep, the car is in the mail. Terence Kudzai Mushanga, who was, or maybe still is, since it seems like they're on again, off again, the boyfriend of South African actress Kanye Mbao. He scammed a Nigerian national out of a bunch of cash in an elaborate car scam. James Aliyu bought two cars from Mushanga, one of which was hijacked and the other stolen, shortly after Aliyu took possession of the vehicle. Although Mashanga was a fugitive from Zimbabwe, he introduced himself to Aliyu as a South African named Dick Lefa Nzula. Yes. We agree. We thought that's as dumb of a made-up name as possible, too. Mushanga sold Aliyu a Mercedes and a Jaguar for 1.22 million South African Rand, which is roughly $63,000. Mushanga gave Aliyu copies of his driver's license, ID, and vehicle papers so that Aliyu could change the ownership and registration of the cars to his name. But when he got to his local DMV, Aliyu learned the documents were fake. Aliyu filed a police report for fraud against Mushanga and an additional report against the thieves who stole the cars. Aliyu believed that Mashanga intentionally orchestrated the thefts and that the criminals that had carried out the thefts worked for him. Mushanga refused to explain why he gave Aliyu a different name and said that even though he had over roughly 1 million US dollars in his bank account, he wasn't going to pay Aliyu back. Mushanga also accused Aliyu of being wanted by the FBI for scamming Americans out of thousands of dollars. He refused to give Aliyu any of his money back as the cash cash Aliyu used to pay Mashanga was the proceeds of a crime. As of the release of this video, there hasn't been a resolution to the case. It has to be weird to be dating a rich celebrity, but still feel like you need to run a scam. And it's not like he scammed all that much money to make the whole thing worth it. Number four, the real fraud of New Jersey. Reality TV personality Joe Judice ended his 41 month prison sentence for fraud by being deported to his home country, Italy. Teresa and Joe Judice Judice rose to fame on the Real Housewives of New Jersey and their glamorous lifestyle and extravagant spending alarmed fans and co-stars. Their wealth seemed endless until the public learned that the couple had overstated their income on loan applications and concealed the money they made from the Bravo hit reality show in a bankruptcy filing. According to their indictment, the Judices obtained millions of home-related loans between 2001 and 2008. They filed loan applications and provided supporting documents to lenders that stated that they had high-paying jobs when the truth was that neither was employed or receiving the high salaries they claimed. In 2001, Teresa applied for a $121,500 mortgage loan where she lied about being employed as an executive assistant and provided fake W-2 forms and pay stubs. She and Joe applied for another mortgage loan of $361,250 in 2005. They put it under Teresa's name and stated in the application that she was a realtor who made $15,000 a month despite being unemployed. The Judices filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy protection in 2009. They intentionally concealed businesses they owned, rental property income, and anticipated income in the filings. By that point, Teresa was making a steady income from the Real Housewives of New Jersey, as well as with website sales and magazine and personal appearances. Although they knew they would have anticipated income from the upcoming second season of their reality show, Teresa and Joe testified under oath about the assets and income they reported in their filings. The couple were charged with bank fraud, conspiracy to commit mail and wire fraud, bankruptcy fraud, and making false statements on loan applications. The couple pleaded guilty in federal court to defrauding lenders of over $5 million when they submitted fraudulent documents for construction and bank loans and by lying to bankruptcy officials and withholding assets. Joe also pleaded guilty to one count of failure to file a tax return. Teresa and Joe had four young children and requested to serve their time in prison separately in order to care for them. Teresa received a 15-month prison sentence, then... At the end of her time behind bars, she returned to the family home and Joe reported to serve his sentence. Although Joe's parents and siblings had U.S. citizenship, Joe never got his. However, since he moved to the U.S. when he was only a year old, he considered himself to be an American. An immigration judge disagreed with his sentiment and ordered he be deported back to Italy. Teresa originally said she would move there with him, but shortly after he returned to his home country, the pair split. She remarried a few years later. Number three, Bollywood bungled.
Bollywood actress Sophia Hayat almost lost her three million pound London home when her boyfriend attempted to sign it over to his ex-wife. Hayat met the scammer after she took a career pivot to become a spiritual healer and spent 18 months at a nunnery. She left that to pursue her relationship with the man that was 15 years younger than her. It seems like Sophia was trying to find herself. Her now boyfriend asked to attend the meditation group that she held in her home and regularly sent her flowers, crystals, chocolates, and perfumes. The unnamed Romanian personal trainer also showered her with compliments about how much he respected her spirituality. The scammer returned to Romania to visit his son and returned with a gold necklace for Hayat. Catching feelings, Hayat asked if he wanted to move in with her, and after three weeks of dating, the couple were sharing a home. Hayat wanted to marry her new partner, but opted for a sacred union ceremony rather than a religious one. She gifted her husband a 20,000-pound Cartier ring and paid for the ceremony, which cost 70,000 pounds. The elaborate event featured white horses, a string quartet, a harp player, and a jazz band. None of the con artist's friends or family attended, with him claiming that he stopped speaking to his father due to money disputes and didn't have any friends in England. Hayat funded most of their expenses and gave the pair a luxurious lifestyle with expensive vacations around the world. One day, Hayat went through her husband's phone and found that he was trying to sell two of her Rolexes. So of course, she freaks and immediately kicks him out of the house, but then allowed him to move back in a week later. Hayat suspected he was having financial troubles that he didn't want to tell her about, so she made some excuses. He claimed that he stole the watches to pay for lawyers because his wife was seeking full-time custody of their son. He had offered to give him thousands of pounds to seek legal advice and even met the alleged lawyer on a trip to Romania. She had dinner with the lawyer's wife and children as well as her husband and his son. The lawyer said Hayat's partner was in a lot of trouble and it would be very expensive to get him out of it. The couple returned from Romania and jetted off to South America to participate in, eh, let's just call it, a guided spiritual journey with some special substance. Substances. Thanks, YouTube. During the experience, Haya asked her husband about the truth of what happened. He admitted that he was stealing money from her business, her safe, and that he was planning to steal her home with his ex-wife. He confessed that he took the deeds of the house from the safe and was hiding them in the back of his closet. This scammer also said that he was still in love with his ex-wife, prompting Hayat to storm out of the ceremony and head back to London alone. Although he tried to tell her that what he said during the ceremony wasn't true, Hayat found a bag in his closet that contained the deeds to her house, her passport, and her birth certificate. Busted! Since his ex-wife had the same hair color as Hayat, she believed that the plan was to have the ex-wife pretend to be her. Hayat found three pairs of her socks in her ex-partner's closet too, which she had been looking for. Whenever she mentioned them, he told her that she was becoming very forgetful. She had blood work done shortly after the relationship ended and discovered her cholesterol level was extremely high, despite her supposed healthy diet and lifestyle. Hayat discovered that the protein shakes he had been making her were loaded with fat. The only valuable item she could prove that he took was the Cartier ring, which she reported to the police, who closed the investigation after a month. Hayat said that after he got arrested for an unrelated theft, the alleged scammer fled the country and went to Romania. Number two, welcome to Scam Island. Sammy Kimmitz, a former stockbroker and boyfriend of British TV personality Danny Dyer from Love Island, defrauded two senior citizens out of $40,000. Kimmitz met 90-year-old Peter Martin and 80-year-old Peter Haynes while working working for Equine Global Sports Limited. But when it closed down, Kimmitz pretended to have moved to another company and continued to make bets on behalf of Martin and Haynes. But instead of placing the bets, Kimmitz used the money to pay the overdraft fees on his bank account and put the rest of the funds towards a luxury hotel stay in Ibiza, paying restaurant bills and buying clothes. Kimmitz also charged $1,600 on one of his victims' credit cards and withdrew over $1,500 using another one of their bank cards. He also convinced them to transfer money to his accounts with Martin sending $28,500 and Haynes transferring 10,000 bucks. Kimmins was arrested and charged with five counts of fraud. By his trial date, Martin had passed away and Haynes had Alzheimer's. The former financial advisor pleaded guilty to five counts of fraud and received a three and a half year prison sentence. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay tuned right here for our past release for some more of the worst romance scammers. Number one, Anne Hathaway and Raffaello Folieri. Early in her Hollywood career, A-list actress Anne Hathaway dated disgraced businessman and scammer Raffaello Folieri. Hathaway was 21 when she met the 25-year-old Italian entrepreneur through a mutual friend. Although she was furious with Folieri for arriving an hour late to their 
first date, the Princess Diaries star couldn't deny how attracted she was to the well-dressed Italian man. Folieri embodied the bad boy persona while dressing in expensive outfits and charming those around him with his charisma. Folieri studied law and economics at the University of Rome and opened his first company, Beauty Planet, in 1999. While Folieri claimed that Beauty Planet produced bulk hair and body care products and was extremely successful, it operated at a loss for almost its entire existence, and most checks the company wrote bounced. Folieri ended up liquidating his 50% share for roughly $8,000 three years into its existence. So, he decided to start a new life in New York City, where he turned his sights on the real estate market. Despite not speaking very much English, he founded the Folieri Group with his father. Folieri appointed himself as chairman and CEO of the Folieri Group and made his father president. The language barrier didn't stop the businessman from making important connections in the Big Apple, including real estate investor Vincent Ponte. Folieri appointed Ponte as the Folieri Group's vice president. Despite his criminal business contacts, Folieri positioned himself as an emissary of the Vatican. He claimed he was the church's man from Rome. The Folieri Group worked on several projects with the Catholic Church in New York. In 2004, the Catholic Church faced one of its biggest crises in its history with the publication of a report about the misdeeds of priests and deacons in the U.S. After a flood of lawsuits, the church paid out almost $2 billion in settlement payments. Having suffered massive financial losses, the institution had to sell some of its property holdings to recover. The Folieri Group was there to assist with selling the properties and promised to sell the buildings to companies that planned on using them in socially responsible manners consistent with the church's ideals. The real estate company also said that it would share a percentage of the profits with the Vatican and its nonprofit, the Folieri Foundation. When Folieri wasn't negotiating business deals or working for the church, he was with Hathaway. He frequently invited her to his penthouse at Trump Tower, cooked her favorite dishes, took her on a private tour of the Vatican and its gardens, and regularly flew her out to Italy. In 2005, Folieri's personal and professional lives were thriving. He met Doug Band, an aide to former President Bill Clinton. Band introduced Folieri to key figures such as Canadian real estate developer Michael Cooper, billionaire Ron Burkle, and Band's former boss, Bill Clinton. Burkle and Folieri formed Folieri Ukepa Investments, a joint venture that developed unused Catholic properties with Burkle pledging $105 million to the cause. Folieri was more focused on networking with Clinton and donated $1 million to the Clinton Global Initiative, putting him on the former president's radar and earning him an invitation to vacation with one of the world's most influential people. Hathaway and Folieri went to the Dominican Republic with the Clintons, but behind the scenes, Folieri's were falling apart. Burkle sued Folieri for misappropriating $1.3 million, and the billionaire alleged in the suit that his money paid for Folieri's $40,000 a month apartment, private chef, and luxury travel. The filing claimed that Folieri ran up the balance of the company's three credit cards and diverted hundreds of thousands of dollars from Folieri Ukepa Investments to his charity, the Folieri Foundation. Folieri's next lawsuit came from the Carmen Group, a public relations firm that the Folieri Group employed but failed to pay its $240,000 tab. A judge ordered that he pay the firm $250,000. News broke that Folieri paid Doug Band 40000 bucks to be introduced to Bill Clinton, prompting the former president to disown him. A spokesperson to the former president went on record to say that Clinton barely knew Folieri. Folieri Group's projects also came under intense scrutiny, including its handling of the church properties it vowed to sell. Although the company alleged it entered into contracts to acquire $100 million of church property, it only acquired a few properties, which either fell into disrepair or were sold for little profit. The property sales should have helped provide financial support to the Folieri Foundation, but that money never came, prompting the foundation to rely on other sources of income, including support from Hathaway, who was a board member at the time. Folieri's legal and financial issues continued to mount when a private jet company sued Folieri for half a million dollars for unpaid air travel between 2006 and 2007. While Folieri was at his Fifth Avenue apartment, NYPD officers arrested him in front of Hathaway for writing a bad check of $215,000 to real estate developer John Morangiello. At the time, Folieri only had $39 in his bank account. Hathaway tearfully watched officials lead Folieri out of the building. Friends and family members allegedly warned the actress Folieri wasn't who he said he was. But it wasn't until the truth about the Folieri Foundation's business dealings came to light that she began to publicly 
separate herself from her disgraced boyfriend. Then, Attorney General Andrew Cuomo launched an investigation into Foliari's nonprofit, prompting Hathaway's publicist to announce that Hathaway was no longer a board member of the foundation. Breakup rumors surrounded the couple, but the pair supposedly only split for a few weeks before getting back together. Federal authorities arrested Foliari in Manhattan for wire fraud, conspiracy, and money laundering charges. An FBI investigation uncovered that Foliari had wired almost $1 million to an account in Monaco to conceal control and location of the funds. He also lied to investors about being the CFO of the Vatican to purchase church properties below fair market value. He swindled six million bucks from real estate investors while posing as a top official at the Vatican. Foliari pleaded guilty and spent five years behind bars. He was deported to Italy upon release and banned from entering the U.S. The last time Hathaway admitted to speaking to Foliari was the night before his arrest. She cut off all contact with him the next day. Tinder swindlers are all over the world. Who are the worst scammers who specialize in fleecing unlucky women who are just looking for love? Let's get right into it. Number five, Brazilian Tinder swindler. He stole the hearts and savings of seven women via Tinder. Then he led the police on a high-speed chase through the streets of Sao Paulo, Brazil in September 2022. But no one expected it to end the way it did. Renan Augusto Gomez decided to go by Augusto Keller on the online dating apps Tinder, Happen, and Lovo. Just like the Netflix famous Tinder swindler, Simon Leviev, Augusto mainly targeted upper middle-class white women between 35 for 40 years old. He used a sob story to get them to pity him and offer their money. Augusto posed as a civil engineer who was looking for love but was plagued by trauma after his German parents died in a car accident in Brazil. He claimed to be raised as an orphan. His profile also mentioned how he loved to cook and he was only interested in a serious long-term relationship. It seemed like Augusto took his relationship seriously. He went to the women's homes and met their families. Once he earned his victim's trust, Augusto asked them for money. Once he got it, he ghosted them right away. He said he had financial issues with the bank or that he owed tax money to the Special Department of Federal Revenue of Brazil. One woman says that Augusto stole more than 35,000 pounds over the course of their relationship. Another woman said that Augusto fled with her money after they decided to go into business together. But the ruse ended when he swindled one woman, a teacher, out of $28,000. They dated for about four months until he mysteriously disappeared with her money. When she called the police on him, she admitted to being suspicious of Augusto for a while since he was always getting a new cell phone. Police tracked down Augusto driving through the streets of Sao Paulo. Augusto started driving away, beginning a high-speed car chase with several marked police cars. Eventually, they caught up with him and rammed into the back of his car, causing Augusto's car to ram into three others. Thankfully, everyone was okay. Number four, Canadian Tinder Swindler. Salim Damji is a scammer extraordinaire, and he found a new way to make a quick buck. He started romancing women in the greater Toronto area, and you guessed it, he convinced them to lend him money. Damji became the leader of a romance and investment Ponzi scheme that cost his 20 victims $1.2 million. Damji and one of his victims, Melissa, met in September 2013. He said he was an RBC investment banker and asked if she wanted to invest with him. She said no that night, but after maintaining a relationship mostly over the phone, for a year, she decided she could trust him with her money. She was caring for a sick relative and could use the extra income. She sent him $50,000 and continued to send him smaller payments. Melissa gave Damji a total of $67,000. Damji promised that her investment would generate big profits, but she started growing suspicious. He was supposed to meet her for dinner on Valentine's Day, but never showed up. He said he had to fly to India last minute to be with his parents after a near-fatal car crash that left both his mother and father in a vegetative state. But when Melissa tested him, he always had the right answer. She asked him the time, wherever he was, and he was always right. Then he started asking Melissa to send money for him to build a school in Ethiopia, which was of interest to her. She gave him a few thousand toward the project, but when she started asking for money back, Damji said his accounts were frozen because the Canada Revenue Agency was investigating him. Melissa took matters into her own hand. She called private investigators who found nothing on the fake name he was using, Salman Darcy. So they continued exchanging flirty messages with Melissa 
believing that he didn't have a record. Eventually, though, he stopped responding. A few months later, Melissa received a message from another woman asking her to stop sending messages to her boyfriend. A few emails later, Damji's supposed girlfriend revealed his real name. That's when Melissa found out about his sordid past. By the time she realized she was scammed out of her life savings, Damji was on the run, and her money was long gone. Melissa eventually found out that all of her money was used toward Damji's gambling addiction. For Damji, scamming was a lifestyle, and he had a routine. Damji would either go to Aurora's fancy restaurant and dance club Greystones, or use the online dating app Plenty of Fish to find his victims. While it originally appeared to investigators like a romance scheme that swindled unsuspecting women out of thousands, turned out that it was actually a Ponzi scheme. Damji told women he was an investment banker and promised various women that if they invested with him, he would bring them generous returns. Damji gave his victims an initial payout to show that their investments were profitable. But then, when they gave him more money to invest, he disappeared. He gave a pitch similar to Richard Gere's in Pretty Woman. He claimed that he bought companies, broke them up, and sold their assets for a profit. He promised to help his victims get out of debt and earn a higher return on investment. One of Damji's accomplices convinced a woman at a bar to invest $50,000, which was used to pay off the initial returns of the other victim. Damji was no stranger to the justice system. In 2002, he scammed thousands of Ismaili Muslims out of millions of dollars. He claimed that his company, Strategic Trading System, had a new teeth whitening technology that was sure to make every investor a millionaire. He promised that Colgate Palmolive would eventually buy the technology for $400 million and double everyone's investment. Damji guaranteed a ridiculous 2,000% return on investment. Ismaili Muslims from all over Canada wanted to invest in Damji's scam, some even throwing $100 bills into his hands as they stood outside a mosque. But instead of working on teeth whitening technology, Damji was living the high life. He lived in an $800,000 luxury condo at Palace Pier and spent even squandering away his victims' money via online casinos. He also bought a strip mall, luxury cars, and homes for relatives. Members of the close-knit Ismaili Muslim community were at first hesitant to go to the police, but did once they became certain that they were duped. Investors found out that he scammed at least 6,000 people and were able to recover $350,000 from Damji's internet casino account based in Costa Rica. Damji was sentenced to seven and a half years in jail after he pleaded guilty to swindling $42 million from 860 66 people in Canada's Ismaili community. The total number of victims from around the world was estimated to be closer to 6,000 in a scam worth at least $69 million. Investigators believe the total financial loss to be closer to $100 million. Since Damji already spent some time in prison, he only had six years and three months left to serve. His victims believe this sentence was nowhere near enough. Police began investigating Damji in 2014 when a victim reported that a man in Aurora convinced her to invest more than $50,000 in his company. But once she sent him the money, he was uncontactable. Officers realized that she wasn't the only one. Several other victims had been scammed in the same way by the same people. In 2015, four men and one woman were arrested in connection to Damji's romance investment scheme. Altogether, 20 women lost at least $12 million. Yao Ming Liang, Shafin Damji, Tatiana Kronova, and Ansari Farhan were among the suspects arrested for the crimes. Damji was charged with several fraud charges, forgery, and providing a false statement in writing. Number three, Aussie Tinder Swindler. Grant Greentree scammed multiple women out of thousands of dollars through online dating platforms. He was on a roll in Australia until he was exposed by none other than his daughter. When Kim Dalquin downloaded Bumble, she was looking for a soulmate. What she found was a scammer. A few right swipes into her search for love, Kim matched with a Maclean who claimed that he was a successful businessman with a large international property portfolio. As they started to get to know each other, MacLean revealed his real name to be Grant Greentree. Despite the red flags, Kim couldn't ignore the deep connection she made with Grant. She was impressed by his success. So when he asked to borrow money, she never doubted that he would pay her back. Every time she expressed any concerns, he had the perfect answer. He promised that he would receive a big payment once he turned 60. In the meantime though, Kim was footing the bill for luxury vacations in million dollar mansions. And when Grant said he wanted Kim to meet his daughter, Isabella, he told Kim an emotional story about how his first wife, Elizabeth, Isabella's mother, died of cancer. Kim and Grant got married in Yara Valley in 2020. But Isabella said her mother was very much alive. As Isabella and Kim sat in the backseat of Grant's car, Isabella asked her dad to turn up the radio and air conditioning so he couldn't hear her telling Kim about her dad's lies. That's when Grant's web of lies started to complete completely unravel. For Isabella, this was nothing new. Her childhood was filled with a revolving door of women. 
One year into his marriage with Kim, she realized that Grant, the man she thought was her forever, was just spinning a web of lies that left her close to broke. When she confronted Grant about a divorce, the loving, caring man she once thought he was completely disappeared. He became angry and threatening. Kim filed a domestic violence order against him to protect herself. Another one of Grant's ex-girlfriends, Melissa Sexton, said she had an on and off relationship with Grant for more than 25 years. It finally ended when he promised to pay back the $33,000 he owed her once he started a new job. She never saw one cent of it, but now she absolutely despises him. His other exes agree. His first wife, who chose to remain anonymous, filed a restraining order against him in 2008 after he allegedly assaulted her. She says she still owed over $400,000 in child support, which would be a drop in the bucket for Grant if his so-called wealth was real. Grant's second wife also applied for a restraining order just a year into their marriage. Grant's lies were not confined to Australia. He began a relationship with an American woman, Trisha Connors, who got pregnant pregnant shortly after meeting Grant. Her son, now 23 years old, has no relationship with his father. Connors is grateful that she got out of that relationship when she did. She called Grant's behaviors sociopathic. Kim tells other women who meet Grant to run fast. Number two, South African Tinder swindler. In 2022, Amon Namera conned at least three women in South Africa out of their money. Of course, he found his victims through Tinder, which earned him the easy nickname, the South African Tinder Swindler in the news. Namera took his dates on lavish dates in an attempt to convince them of his wealthy lifestyle. Then he asked to borrow money and promised to pay it back. He went so far as to meet his dates' as friends and family, convincing them that he was a trustworthy and kind partner. Many of the women were wooed by Namera's charm and fancy dates. A single mother of two just came out of a stressful relationship when she started talking to Namera. They met for lunch, and she thought he was a sweetheart. In August of 2020, Namera told her he was struggling financially. He asked to borrow 15,000 Rand. Namera promised to pay it back by the weekend. He continued asking for money from her with the promise to pay it back. Eventually, Namera owed the woman 52,000 Rand plus an additional 60,000 Rand worth of items from her boutique. One of the big ticket products was a Rolex watch worth 10,000 Rand. Meanwhile, Namera promised another woman a romantic getaway. But first, he needed some money for the book. She gave him 16,000 Rand, and he left her stranded at the airport. The woman took to social media to express her anger. Soon, other women started coming forward with similar experiences. Namera, originally from Uganda, didn't just steal money. He swindled his matches out of jewelry and clothing, too. He told his Tinder matches that he was a millionaire in the fuel industry who owned a Bentley and had several properties in Johannesburg, South Africa. He said he was involved in international business. Eventually, authorities caught wind of Namera's scam. He was arrested and charged with fraud in March 2020. Number one, Tinder swindler stoppers. We're about to do a 180 right now. Instead of focusing on the Tinder swindlers, we're going to discuss a couple of girls who busted a Tinder swindler. Two sisters from New Zealand, Emma and Sarah Ferris, teamed up to stop a Tinder swindler from stealing $300,000 from Emma. Well, sort of. Emma matched with Andrew Tonks Thompson on Tinder in 2018, and they hit it off right away. But little known to the single mother of two, Andrew was living a double life as a con man. Several restaurants and former employees lawyers had claims against Andrew. In 2007, he was charged with stealing after he sold a company car and used the money to buy a motorbike. He was sentenced to 100 hours of community service. He warned Emma not to look him up online because he had been the victim of identity theft. He made fake financial documents to show her that he was a successful entrepreneur, former AFL player, and professional wakeboarder. So when he told Emma he wanted to invest in property with her, she trusted him. She gave him $50,000. Right as Emma gave him another $250,000, she learned that her boyfriend and an investment partner was a liar and a convicted con man. Instead of confronting him right away, Emma decided to play along with his game. When she asked for the money back, Andrew promised to pay it back as soon as he finished his latest foreign spy mission, which was also a lie. He wrote her a letter saying that he was a spy for a counterterrorism unit, which is why he had to be so secretive. She gathered enough evidence to bring to the authorities. New Zealand police found Andrew as he landed in Christchurch and brought him directly to the Christchurch men's prison. Andrew, thinking that Emma still had no idea of his past, told the police officer to call her and say that he wasn't going to make it to their date the next day. Andrew was sentenced to 28 months in jail for stealing $300,000 from Emma in addition to fraud against a Queenstown restaurant owner and alcohol company. He was ordered to pay Emma $63,800 and an additional $8,000 for emotional harm, still far less than what she was owed. But Emma later learned that Andrew successfully appealed and got the $8,000 reduced to 
prison. And he was out on parole using the dating app Bumble. When Emma heard the news that Andrew was out of jail and ready to target more women, she sprung into action. She teamed up with her sister to start a podcast called Conning the Con, dedicated to telling her story and warning women about scammers lurking on dating apps. By broadcasting her experience, Emma learned about several other women that Andrew swindled in the past. One of Emma's most important tips is to listen to your gut. If you feel like there are red flags, you're probably right. She also said that if something doesn't feel right, look up your date's name online and ask them about their dating intentions. Most of all, Emma encourages her listeners to be comfortable by themselves before looking for a partner. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comment section who you think is the most annoying celebrity today.